just introduce Emily King. Um, Emily is the Program Manager for Research and Extension in AWI. Um, Emily hails from the central New South Wales and has always worked in agriculture, beginning her career with Australian Livestock and Property Agents Association before moving to AWI in 2012. Emily has worked in a number of teams at AWI but currently fills the role of Program Manager Research and Extension and is responsible for the reproduction and nutrition research portfolio and grower extension development. Today, Emily will speak on smart tags, what are they and how do they work. She'll then give an update on the latest research and how producers could use these tags to monitor animals and improve management. So thanks very much, Emily. Thank you, Emily, very much for your kind introduction. Uh, there's that ram from before that everyone likes so much, just for you, uh, You'll notice um, probably that uh, he's a bit messier on the nose in the video than he was in the still picture earlier. Um, so thank you very much for having me here today. I will be having a bit of chat about um, smart tags and some work that AWI is doing in development there. I'll also have a chat to you about um, some of the work uh, Henry's already covered, shearing shed design and what we've been doing there, but we're also doing some work on technology, wearable technology for shearers, so that we can try and reduce the fatigue um, issues and stress on the muscles and that sort of thing for shearers, so that we can hopefully keep more good shearers in the industry for longer and improve, um, improve their work life and also reduce the risk of injury. And also a little bit on um, wool cue as well today. So um, Henry, um, obviously you've already heard from, and just down the back of the room we've got um, AWI's Chief Operating Officer John Roberts, who is actually SA based, so he'll be here today if you want to have a chat with him, and um, Andrew Dennis as well, who is the SA WoolQ rep. So um, I will crack into this now and uh, looking at AWI smart tags to begin with. So you can see there in the ear of that U there, there's a tag, a white tag there, so that is this tag here. So these are the tags that we've been working on. So that, um, in the front of that, that's a solar panel. So um, we've deliberately chosen not to go with GPS in terms of uh, location um, for these, and we're using triangulation and using uh, low-range RFID for this. So, um, so there's a couple of reasons we decided not to go with GPS. Um, one of them is the cost that that would put into it, um, and then the weight of the component tree as well, and also the power demand that they have. So with this solar panel, we can keep that running with no battery, no nothing in there. We can keep that running on the sheet to provide the power um, to run the tag that we need. Then you can see um, on that lamb there that there is a collar on the lamb. Um, and so these are the collars that we've got. So this is um, stretchy collar, so you can use that for things like mothering up. So the U would wear a permanent tag and you might just collar the lamb for a short term period um, to do mothering up um, by proximity, that sort of thing. And then I don't have one here today, but in the bottom right there you can see a harness on a ram. So we're looking at some um, reproduction uh, work at the moment that I'll explain a bit more about. So as I said, the AWI smart tags that we're looking at are solar powered ear tag and there's also battery collar and the RAM harness. And we're trying to make these so that they're a combination of different technologies so that they're not um, just, I guess, a one trick pony for want of a better uh, phrase. So we're looking in there at having um, an accelerometer. And so uh, the accelerometer is able to tell us things about, you know, whether the animal is walking or grazing or ruminating um, all those types of things. Um, location, so location of where they are in the paddock and proximity, so proximity of one sheep to another via the information that's fed back by the tag. So that becomes really important if you're trying to have a look at um, mounting events for joining um, or, you know, whether the animals are grouped up in a really tight, you know, whether they've been pushed up in the corner, for example, if there's a predator in the paddock and there's a, some abnormal behaviour happening in the paddock. Um, so to get that data, we use these receivers. So these sit out in the paddock. This one's a bit um, funky and yellow looking because it's been out in a paddock. Um, so these we use, um, we just at the moment just attach them to a um, star post in the paddock. Um, and then the range of each of these boxes is about one kilometre at this stage. Uh, we are trying to improve that and um, so that's over fairly flat sort of ground at the moment. If you had, um, if you've got more hilly terrain it won't 
cover as far, um, but we're trying to improve that all round. And as because the um, all of the location and stuff works on triangulation, so you need um, signals to bounce off a minimum of three of these boxes out in the paddock to understand how far they are from each of the boxes to give you the location of that animal out in the paddock. So every day there's more than 45,000 data points collected per animal that's wearing a tag and so obviously we don't expect you to actually sit there and find useful, uh, meaningful um, information in 45,000 data points per sheep per day. So what we're also doing is writing algorithms, um, so I guess computer getting a computer to understand what all of those bits of information mean so that we can just spit you back um, a quick message or an email to just say, oh, I think there might be a bit of a problem. None of your sheep have gone to water today, potentially. Things like that. So a few of those things that we are looking at, we're looking at welfare alerts. Um, so for example, um, can we understand by the movement that the sheep is making that they have a high worm burden without you having seen it yet? Um, you know, is there a potential to pick up, you know, when sheep are lousy, is there a special way that the sheep moves that we will be able to see? For example, you know, can we pick up that they're always rubbing up fences or trees? Um, grazing and feeding intake, um, having a look at net feed efficiency and, um, and how sheep are utilising the paddock and the regions of the paddock in which they're grazing. Predation alerts, um, so, you know, could be anything but uh, likely a dog or a fox, I guess. Um, and reproductive management as well. So um, this property um, here that you can see in the picture, that's a property at Buckholden in central Queensland. It's about 28,000 hectares, so we're looking at it as one of the trial sites so that we can get some extensive um, pastoral zone testing happening. Um, and so the work there is um, being done by AWI and Central Queensland University having a look at um, whether we can in fact pick up predation um, and the disease uh, for the worms as well. Um, hasn't been particularly wormy out in central Queensland in the last little while, hasn't been a great deal of rain, hasn't been a lot to pick up there, uh, which is great on one hand, but um, if you're trying to pick it up, it's not real crash hot. Um, there have been some challenges there in terms of robustness and retention for the tags. So we're working on that at the moment and then we'll be putting those tags back out. But this is why we're doing these trials so that we can pick those issues up before we go to market with that. Grazing Bites is in collaboration with Murdoch University, which is out of Perth. Um, and, um, and you can see there that um, this sheep is rigged up uh, with a poo collection bag there. And so what we're, um, what we're doing is collecting all the faecal matter uh, that comes out of that sheep because we've got tags in and so we can understand what the sheep is taking in versus what is coming out the back end um, or isn't coming out the back end um, in some cases. Um, and we're collecting this data across a range of grazing um, types. So, you know, mixed sheep cropping and also out into the pasture zone and the high rainfall zone so we can understand across different types. Um, we're hoping to accurately predict feed on offer um, by understanding the grazing behaviour of the sheep, how quickly they're walking and moving through the paddock, all those types of things. At the moment, the, um, the baseline early stage data is telling us that um, we can't accurately predict at the moment down to one day, but we can get it pretty accurate out when we take in three days of data. And, um, and we think that at the moment we might only need to tag 40% of the mob to get accurate readings for the whole Mob. The reproductive um, projects are being run in collaboration with the University of Sydney and so we want to understand how we can better predict and understand reproductive behaviour. So we're looking to understand, um, you know, detection of oestrus, having a look at um, mounting, um, you know, for example, we might be able to tell um, very quickly if a ram is only, you know, has only done a quarter of the work that the other rams in the paddock have done and whether his libido is a bit low or something like that. Um, and also lambing events. So, I mean, you know, some applications for this potentially, if we can easily detect oestrus, we might be able to have, um, you know, a hormone-free AI protocol, for example. So, um, this is a bit of a video, and you'll see um, these, um, these spikes in the, um, in the graph here are the mounting events. And so you'll see, um, so this ram that's about to run along the back of the shed there is tagged. And so you'll see what happens here when he runs through. So 
You thought you were going to see some ram porn today, didn't you? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so, so we have here, um, so we can, um, this trial um, was, uh, as you saw, um, on a research site. And um, the, it came back, it was quite good. We were able to quite well pick up the um, mounting events and all that sort of thing. When we put it out into its first paddock trial, the results weren't so clear. So sometimes there'd be other rams hanging around, so the proximity um, was being affected, all that sort of thing, and other ewes hanging around. So, um, so what we have done with that. And so, yeah, so we've got that trial running at the moment. Um, we did, um, because we wanted to make sure all of those animals came in on time, we did, um, did cedar those um, those sheep to bring all of their estrus all synced up, um, and so then so that you know basically when the researchers were out visually checking mating times, um, so that we could match it up with the data. So um, so that trial is underway now, and all of those ewes should have been joined by now. So one example of something that actually happened with um, a flock that we had the smart tags on. Um, the manager of that place rang up and said one of the ewes that had a tag in has died. And, um, and he thought that it might have been wild dogs that had got that ewe. So we went back and had a look. And so this was in the early days when we were still collecting data and we um, didn't actually you know, have the algorithms in place to understand what the data was saying in real time. And so we had a look here. And so that line of orange bars across the top there is um, when she was grazing. And this is her just standing around and the bottom is walking. So you can see she's basically not walked at all. So this time period from here is um, May 10th through till um, the 20th of May. Um, so for in 10 days, she's barely walked at all. She's done a, a hell of a lot of standing around and a little bit of grazing just in her immediate area. And so we actually went and had a look at that ewe and um, she had twins on board. So we concluded that actually she probably more likely had died of pregnancy toxemia than had died of um, than had died of a dog attack. And so this predation that you can see here is um, post post death predation. Um, and you can see as well that you know there was a long period where she didn't move a great deal, and then there was a little bit of head movement there, and we think that was bird predation on the carcass that has moved that ear tag around a bit. Also, these this graph here is showing you the closest tags to that ewe, so um, what sheep were in proximity with her at any given time on any day and for how long each they spent. And so here you can see that, um, you know, probably what we'd consider to be a fairly normal amount um, of contact with the other sheep. Um, and, then, and then on the day she died, that spiked back up again. So it looks as though a lot of the other sheep came in, had a look, checked out what was going on, and then they've basically, after they've realised she's dead, have completely left her alone and haven't gone back near her. So we think that there's also some interesting things that this type of data can tell us about um, behaviour and about flock um, behaviour and how animals move in family packs and that sort of thing as well that can help us better understand um, how they operate. Um, shearing is uh, one of the most strenuous jobs out there and is one of the ones that WorkCover has the most injuries um, associated with. Uh, and so what we want to understand is could we put some sort of um, um, sensor onto a shearer's body to understand when they're fatiguing and see if we could maybe give them an alert or something to say, you know, you're getting into a period of high risk of injury, you need to stop or you need to stretch or you need to whatever the case may be. And so in, in this work, when we're trying to understand Shearer's injuries and how these are happening, this um, graph um, basically looks at the muscles in the lower back and how well they stretch and then recover. So the higher the dots on here, the better the recovery. So you can see in the first run, things are going quite well. I mean, there's a fair, fair bit down in this bottom section, but the shearer is recovering quite well. And as we move through the runs of the day over out to run four, he's basically got nothing up in this recovery. So all he's doing is just continuously straining his muscle. So what happens is when those muscles stretch, they need to retract back in the lower back and it just wasn't happening. They were just staying stretched and so then when, for example, a lot of injuries happen during the catch and drag and usually due to a quick sudden movement. So, for example, if a shearer goes in and goes to, um, you know, tip 
a sheep over and then the sheep sort of ducks one way and they quickly reach out to grab it back, then they can put extra pressure on their back and that can move and their muscles aren't taut enough and snapped back into place and resilient enough to hold all of that back together and things can slip out where they shouldn't be. So um, what we wanted to do is look at, you know, is there a way that we can have an alert or um, try and mitigate that before that injury of risk occurs. Uh, so this is um, this is a video showing you. So that shearer is this shearer here is wearing the technology. So he's out in the catching pen at the moment, and so he's wearing a number of different sensors. So you can see he's um, there. He comes out onto the board, and so um, this was in the early days. So you might be able to see there's um, a hunk of MacGyver tape around his mock there. So we don't think that that's probably how we'll do it in the long run, but you know for proof of concept trial. Um, and you can see there's sensors here on his arms and um, on his wrists. Um, on, he's wearing a belt there around his lower back. So looking at a number of key pressure points. Um, and so what we think is that um, we are going to now, so that proof of concept was quite successful. We've um, understood a lot more than we did before about shearer injuries. And so what we're going to look at um, in the next phase of that is a conceptual design for an active solution, so something that a shearer might be able to wear. So whether that might be a belt around their lower back or something to let them know when they're hitting those risk periods. Um, having a look at the effectiveness of prevention, intervention and fatigue management. So for example, um, you know, what would be the most effective stretches to do before the start of every run? Um, or is there a stretch that you could do in the middle of every run that would lower your risk of injury? Um, and also, of course, shed design as well. So trying to straighten up the catch and drag, making sure you've got sloping pens and all those sorts of things that Henry discussed. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at at the moment um, is we did an international um, expression of interest to have a look at maybe what we could do in terms of improving shearing shed design and around um, hand pieces and that sort of thing. Um, one of the, I think we got about 35 applications from around the world to that and, um, and the one that we are working with at the moment is to have a look at um, changing the design of um, the handpiece so that it would um, not require um, a down tube and not require overhead gear and it would be battery operated and that the shearer would wear the battery. Um, what we're also looking at doing is integrating sensors and all that sort of thing into the um, handpiece so that um, it would reduce skin cuts and second cuts and so that maybe it would let you know, you know if you're coming up off the skin or you're not close up to the skin and um, you know whether you're tipping too far forward or back and the angle's wrong on the handpiece. Uh, it's not sitting on the skin nicely. Um, so what we've been looking at is, um, and basically I guess what we've used as, you know, what would need to be the absolute minimum um, would be the, um, would need to, the battery would need to go for at least two hours so they could complete a run without having to change a battery and that it would at least need to have the power of a Heinegger Evo to run with. And the automated wool handling project is um, a new project that we've started working on um, to have a look at whether we can build a semi-autonomous wool handling system to go from the wool table through to baling. Um, so we're looking at the four main components, um, including automated inspection system um, to identify fleece contamination, automated skirting and removal of pieces. Um, an optical inspection for automatic wool classification, so wool classing, and um, automated sorting and baling. Right, now through to wool Q. What is wool Q? Uh, wool Q is an innovative new resource for the Australian wool industry. AWI invested on behalf of Australian wool growers in the wool selling systems review. And out of that review, overwhelmingly, the response was that Australian wool growers um, were quite keen to see more, um, I guess, more competition for their wool, um, be able to put their wool into an online um, online system and also to have a bit of a one-stop shop. So out of that came the online platform that is WoolQ. Um, so basically, I guess it's a set of digital tools um, which should allow more informed decision making and allow you to capture data and get data fed back in from uh, across the supply chain as well. Okay, so an industry network. So um, 
the Woolcue platform provides uh, an online platform, an online um, message board, all that sort of thing. Growers can get on there, can put their own profile up. So you can put a profile up for your wool growing enterprise, um, you know, put up some nice pictures of home or, you know, put up pictures of shearing, that sort of thing, and create your own, I guess, sort of like a LinkedIn profile um, for your farm on the platform. Uh, it's also got a built-in e-speci as well. So um, on some work that we've done, we estimate that over a million dollars could be saved in the wool industry each year if everyone moved to e-species. Uh, this is just basically because it would be removing a number of the manual um, transmission errors and that sort of thing that happen. You know, sheds are a busy place and sometimes um, some of the people um, who are working in the sheds or in the brokerages um, might not have the best handwriting. So that should just help eliminate some of that, um, some of that human error there. The great thing is as well that the eSpecy then stores all of that digitally and keeps it within your WoolQ account. And so then what you can get back is the information from your wool testing and this can be automatically uploaded into the back as well. So you see what you sent in um, based on your eSpecy and then you get your wool test results back from that as well and that goes in it. And then that saves year after year after year so that you can keep that as an ongoing record of how your clip has performed in different years. There's also a ready retina, so um, I'm not sure some of you here might have um, used wool check um, over the years. Wool check is basically um, you know, takes in a lot of um, industry information to understand how, um, you know, what prices, what the predicted prices are based on how the market has been selling and Ready Reckoner is the updated version of that. And so that is all, um, you know, it's just an estimation of current market value. And that is all within the WoolQ platform as well. And the great thing is you've got your eSpecy sitting there, you've got your test results sitting there, so you can plug in what your test results say and what you think your estimated price should be. Uh, WoolQ Market as well, so um, it would be the marketplace enabling um, you to pop your wool on there, to brokers to put your wool on for you. Um, and then wool can sit there, so there is also, there's a live auction uh, aspect to it, but there's also an opportunity to post wool there for sale, and then that wool can be bought by anyone, anytime. Um, you know, they don't have to wait for the auction to be open to do that. And so then, again, the flow of information back, once your wool is sold, um, whether it be at traditional auction or, um, you know, on the platform, that information also gets fed back in as well. So you can keep a running tally year on year of how your wool's performed. In closing, I just want to pop up the AWI R&D contacts there. So um, the research team is headed up by Jane Littlejohn, um, but all of the contacts there are for you. And then down the bottom, we've also got Stephen Fain and Marius Cumming, who are the general managers who work within the um, consultation wool grower services team, um, which is where Henry works for AWI. So, um, of course, Henry and I are here um, and more than happy to answer any questions. Of course, you've got John Roberts and Andrew Dennis for WoolQ as well. Um, but thank you very much. And do I have time for questions? Oh, yeah, I've got time for questions. <laughs> thank you, Emily. Do we have any questions for Em? Yes, is the smart tag being developed? for virtual fencing? Yeah, so uh, virtual fencing at the moment, the only, um, the only technology that we know of um, at the moment, which is um, one that's been co-invested by AWI, MLA, Dairy Australia, um, and a few other CSIRO, um, it's on a collar, and it is only available for cattle at this stage. Um, the big problem for sheep with, um, with virtual fencing is the wool um, blocking the sensors. Uh, blocking the electrical stimulation. So virtual fencing basically works by, um, so you would set up, um, you know, an imaginary line in a paddock that you don't want your animals to cross. When the animals approach that line, they will receive an auditory cue, so they'll get a loud beep or something, and hopefully that'll turn them back. If that doesn't happen, then there's an electrical stimulus, and then if the animal proceeds towards that imaginary line, they get another electrical stimulus. Um, so, um, so there are some, um, I guess there are some, um, a few blocks as well to the rollout of um, virtual fencing. Um, so the company Adjacents who have the patent for the virtual fencing for the collars for cattle, um, there are a number of states which uh, the regulations prohibit any sort of virtual fencing because of the electrical stimulus. Um, so. 
One option that was suggested for sheep was that um, maybe you could apply the electrical stimulus via an e-tag. Um, in Victoria, that's already banned. Um, and um, New South Wales, currently, you can't use virtual fencing um, because it's illegal to apply that electrical stimulus that way. And, um, and then in WA as well, there are some regulatory issues. So there are, um, yeah, so there are some issues at the moment to getting that um, delivered in a broad scale way. I do know that um, New South Wales DPI are um, lobbying the government for a change in regulation at this point. But, um, but yeah, I guess it'll just be interesting to see where the state regs go. Um, but usually, I mean, in terms of welfare legislation, generally, if it's already banned in one state, it's usually um, moves forward that way around the other states rather than being repealed. Has any work been done on cameras on sheep? Or is that not practical? Cameras? Yeah, instead of you've got a visual account of what's going on in your flock. Yeah. Um, day by day, or what the habits are, are they drinking and working? Uh, all that sort of thing? Yeah, so I know we have done some work with um, predation management um, with cameras um, and understanding, um, and understanding um, you know, using motion sensors and that sort of thing on the perimeters of the paddocks and understanding how the flock's moving and using um, um, ID so that we can understand, you know, because obviously a kangaroo could bounce past or whatever and understanding is it really a dog or is it something else. Um, in terms of actual understanding um, behaviours, um, I know that there has been some used in, um, in trial work so that we can understand, you know, if we need to see something specific, but I don't know of any work that's currently underway in terms of in paddock behaviour, yeah. I think there are some water telemetry systems yep. that are currently using cameras. Is that mostly though just to monitor the water or to monitor yeah. the sheep? I think it's both, but okay. yeah, yeah, but not on the sheep themselves. Yep. Um, just with um, how long do you reckon you'll still have to work on the tags and stuff and what kind of cost would it be to set up yep. that kind of thing? Yeah, so a um, bit of a how long's a piece of string at this point. Um, we don't want to release it until it's, you know, um, robust enough to release. Um, these, um, at the moment, um, our... Our aim is to get these to at least be less than ten dollars a tag um, at the moment. So we're hoping for somewhere around six bucks, but we're thinking we have, they have to be sub ten to be a going concern for anybody. Um, don't tell Carolina I told you this, but um, <laughs> she didn't want me to quote a price. But I think you know you got to tell people. Um, so at the moment, what we're looking at with these, um, they're not in full scale production or anything, but we'd be hoping that we can get these for one twenty per unit or less. Um, and then I guess it would just be, um, from there on, it would be what you want to use the tags for and what functionality you're hoping to get out of them. If you want to do mothering up, every ewe and lamb would need to have a tag and a collar. If you want to do um, grazing, you might only need to tag 40% of your mob. Um, for predation, for example, we're getting that work done at the moment to understand how many in the mob we would need tagged. Um, but considering, you know, usually when there's a predation threat, the whole mob will move. We think, you know, you might only maybe need 10% to understand predation, um, if that's your main concern. But if you want the tags to do sort of everything, the full breadth of what they're capable for, um, you'd likely need to tag, you tag your whole mob. But then these, um, these are battery operated and these are designed to just go onto the lamb. Um, you know, so these, um, these only need to be within proximity of the U tag for two days to be 98% accurate. So, you know, you can, you, you know, you could potentially, you know, obviously I know the labour would be quite a lot, but you could go out and you could um, collar one mob of ewes and lambs and then, you know, you could pull those collars off and then go and collar it. You know, you wouldn't necessarily need to have 2,000 collars because you've got 2,000 lambs. You can reuse those. Yeah. Hi, Emily. Emily, is there any work being done with the uh, sort of automatic condition scoring of sheep? Uh, yep, I believe there is. Um, not by us, but there is. Um, I know of two different projects, um, and I've received nothing more than cursory information on those. Um, one of them's being um, one of them was, um, I think one's being looked at by University of Adelaide, and I believe, and one is also um, New South Wales DPI. 
Um, just for my question, I think South Australia is one of those states that doesn't currently allow virtual fencing, but um, the legislation is being looked at and reviewed at the moment, so it's watch this space. Um, my question's around, um, I guess we're being bombarded with data and stuff as it is, and we've all got apps and things that we use now. Is there scope for this work to just be integrated into things we're already using, like if you're using AgriWeb or Maya Grazing or something, that this just puts more into those things rather than another? Thing that we have to use? 100%. Yes. Um, yeah, our, um, our aim, so we haven't quite got to that point yet, but yes, our aim would be that um, that, that would be able to, that we'd just be able to supply an API and that, so, a, you know, a backdoor data sharing thing um, to allow that data just to go into some of those other. I think AD, um, AgriWeb's are already receiving WoolQ data, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, we have, um, I guess, um, we will certainly build some sort of functionality so that the, um, you know, so that there would be an app or something you could have if you had these tags so that you could get those alerts directly through. Um, but absolutely, we'd be looking to integrate it with other existing platforms so that, you know, and particularly things like my grazing and that sort of thing so that, it, you know, especially looping grazing stuff and that sort of thing, yeah, 100%. Just a quick one. Um, if DNA testing was a lot cheaper, do we have to worry about any of this? Uh, collars and BID tags for use um, when surely the throughput through the DNA mobs, um, if they got a lot more commercial um, animals through, would outweigh the fact they charge a lot of money for that service. Uh, is that all it takes, is to, to drop that DNA price to, to make the, the collars and so on superfluous? Yeah, um, yeah, I reckon it could, for sure. Um, I guess the only, I suppose that's why we're sort of looking at the tags being able to multi-purpose things um, so that they wouldn't just be doing one thing. Um, so yeah, I think, but I think if that's, if people only want the tags for parentage, I guess, yeah, that would be an individual business decision and having a look at, you know, what's the cost outlay for the tags and what's the cost outlay for DNA testing and what's quicker and easier for your business and makes more financial sense, absolutely, yeah.